We have less than 30 games to go in the regular season, and through all the craziness, there's been a group of teams in each conference that, in my mind, have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. So today, I'm going to rank the 10 teams most likely to win the NBA title this season from 10 to 1. But before we get started, go ahead and leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more NBA videos just like this one. So without further ado, let's get started by talking about my number 10 team, the Dallas Mavericks. The Mavericks get the edge over teams on the bubble like the Heat because Luka Doncic has been on another level this season. His per game averages of 34, 10, and 8 and overall impact on the court as a primary ball handler has allowed him to re-enter the MVP conversation despite his team sitting at 8th in the West. And that's because this Mavericks team would be absolutely nothing without him. In the 8 games Luka has missed this season, the Mavericks have won 3 and lost 5 with double-digit defeats to the Timberwolves, Rockets, and Grizzlies. But when Luka plays, this team just looks different, and after a rough patch in January, the Mavericks have won 7 of their last 9, and only look to improve even further after the acquisitions of Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington. The key to the Mavericks' eventual playoff run will be Kyrie Irving and Tim Hardaway Jr. Both of these guys have been absolutely great this season, but in order for Dallas to succeed, they need Kyrie to keep being an effective second option to potentially bail out Luka when he has an off night, and they need Hardaway Jr. to continue his nightly scoring outbursts where Luka and Kyrie need a rest. And the good thing for Mavericks fans is that I genuinely believe they can, but here's why I don't have them any higher. First and foremost, if the Mavericks stay in the 5th to 7th seed range, they're going to have to go through 3 of the top 5 seeds in the West just to make it to the finals. And while I've raved about Luka and the valuable offensive contributions from role players, what I haven't talked about is their below average defensive efforts. And in the playoffs when you're facing a Jokic, Leonard, SGA, or Durant every night, you're going to need someone who can at least contain them. And even if the Mavericks had someone like that, they would still need to stop the secondary stars on all those teams, which they just can't do. The Mavericks have a really high ceiling, but also the lowest floor out of all of these teams, so for that reason, they sit at the 10th spot. At the 9th spot, I have another team starting to heat up, the Phoenix Suns. The Suns are one of the toughest teams to gauge in the entire league, because they are so incredibly reliant on their three top stars, that if one of them goes down, this team won't last long in the playoffs. But since all three stars have been relatively healthy, the Suns have been rolling, boasting a record of 17-9 since January 1st. But in order for the Suns to compete for a title, they need a couple of things to go their way. First and foremost, they need their three top stars to show out. I don't think their depth is necessarily bad, as Eric Gordon, Grayson Allen, Yusuf Nurkic, and the newly acquired Royce O'Neal are solid role players that will be valuable in a playoff series. But this team will go nowhere without nightly contributions from Durant, Booker, and Beal. And secondly, and most importantly, what makes me hesitant to put the Suns higher despite having two of the 12 best players in the league is their lack of size. In the regular season, it's not a problem, but in the playoffs, when they have to get through a Jokic or Cat and Gobert, their lack of a true rim protector or dominant big man is going to be a big problem. But despite all of this, the Suns still have Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, two stars who are going to put on an offensive masterclass no matter who is defending them. And for that reason, it would be foolish of me to put them any lower than ninth. At number 8, I have the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now look, I know the Cavs have been on a tear since the new year, going 19-5 with big wins over the Bucks and Clippers. But something just feels off about this team, whether that be the fact that I can't get their disappointing first round exit from last season out of my head, or whether I'm nervous that their starting five is one of their worst lineups statistically speaking. Now I've come around on the Garland and Mitchell backcourt within the past month, but I'm still not sold on the Jared Allen and Evan Mobley frontcourt, and for good reason. This team works best when only one of those two are on the court, and the reason why is their lack of spacing, as neither guy can reliably shoot past the mid-range, and in the modern NBA, that's a critical part to winning basketball games. And while this team is obviously better when Garland and Mobley are with the starting group, does it say something that this team finally started to click when both went out with injuries? But even with these potential issues, I'm still leaning towards putting the Cavs above the Suns and Mavericks in this ranking because, on paper, this team is as talented as some of the best in the league. And it's because of their stifling defense, which ranks second in the NBA, and their bench, which is full of shot makers and efficient three-point shooters. 
I'm curious to see where the Cavs end up in the standings because their final odds are, to me, based on who they play in that first round. If they play a team like Indiana, who's already beaten them twice and can run them out the gym with their dangerous offense, then I would be very worried. But if they luck into playing the Embiid last Sixers or the Orlando Magic, I would trust Mitchell and the Cavs to find a groove and potentially give top contenders like the Bucks and Celtics a run for their money. This is a good team, just one that, like the previous two, has a floor that could see them getting bounced in the first round, and for that reason, I have to put them at number 8. Coming in at number 7 is the New York Knicks. Now, I'm a big fan of the Knicks after their excellent trade deadline that added Bojan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks to an already stacked lineup. And it would be easy for a lot of people to have the Knicks this low because they don't have a top 10 player on their team, which is pretty much the recipe to win a title. But I don't think Jalen Brunson being the top guy on this team will be a problem. In fact, if he continues to play the way he has been this season, he's going to be one of the best players in the playoffs. The problem I have with the Knicks right now is their current day injuries. At this point in time, Julius Randle and Oji Ananobi will be out for at least another 2-3 weeks. And since their injuries, the Knicks have lost 7 of their last 10, and then the next few weeks, they have matchups with the East's best, the Cavs, and the Celtics. As long as two of their best three guys are out with injuries, they could absolutely fall down in the standings, as they're only two games above the 8th seed. And while I don't believe that they're going to be that far down by the end of the season, if they stay around the 6th seed, today they would go against the Bucks, who despite their struggles, still have Giannis and Dame. It's going to be an uphill battle for the Knicks for the rest of the season. But what intrigues me about this team, and the reason why they're higher than higher seeded teams, is that they have the best depth in the NBA, and their stars have been showing out the entire season. It's a team that relies on defense to get the job done, and those teams will always show out in the playoffs. So for that reason, I'm going to stick with the Knicks at 7, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if they make it to the conference finals, and maybe even the NBA finals. At number 6, I have the OKC Thunder. There's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the Thunder's championship chances, including Shea Gilgis Alexander, who's had one of the three best seasons in the NBA so far, and a great supporting cast full of sharpshooters and lockdown defenders. And I don't have the second seed OKC Thunder this low because I don't think they can't make noise in the playoffs. I have them this low because history is against them. When you think of the teams that make it far in the playoffs, it's normally a team that has a lot of playoff experience, like the Lakers last season, who made it to the conference finals despite being the 7th seed. Well, the Thunder have next to no playoff experience, other than a series in 2020 where Shea and Lou Dort lost to the Rockets, and previous experience from Gordon Hayward, who hasn't been a key contributor on a playoff team in over 4 years. But despite the lack of experience, the Thunder have one of the 6 easiest schedules for the rest of the season, and because Shea is still in MVP conversations, this team is going to continue pushing forward to strengthen his case. But unfortunately for them, if they get a top seed, they may have to run into a Lakers or Warriors team that is full of former champions. And while I'd probably take the Thunder in a series like that, I don't think it's a guarantee that they're going to get through the first round. And even if they do, they'll have to face a team with either one of two things. A team with playoff experience, or a team with size, which is something they've struggled with all season long. I don't want this to seem like I'm against the Thunder making a run in the playoffs, because I absolutely think they can. History is against them, but many of those past teams didn't have a guy like SGA, or a team constructed around their star that is nearly perfect. But because their path to the finals is going to be so extremely hard, I'm going to have to put OKC at 6th. At number 5, I have the Milwaukee Bucks. Despite the drama, inconsistencies, and clear regression since their 2021 title run, the Milwaukee Bucks still have two of the most dangerous playoff performers in the league. It was only two years ago that Giannis Antetokounmpo carried the Bucks to a finals win, and we all know how talented of a shot maker Dame Lillard is in the final minutes of a big game. What I'm more worried about is two things, consistency from the starting lineup and bench production. I mentioned how Dame is a great shot maker in the clutch, but despite having some big games within the last two months, Lillard has been a complete unknown heading into every game as he could put up 25-30 to 30 points, or he could come in and shoot 33% from the field and finish with 15. In order for the Bucks to advance in the playoffs, they are going to obviously need some form of consistency from Lillard, especially since Middleton and Lopez are not the same offensively from the Bucks' 2021 title run. 
and second and most importantly, they need someone on that bench to step it up. Stars are obviously going to be where the majority of the offensive production comes from, but teams only succeed in the playoffs if everyone is contributing at a high level. And so far through this season, I haven't seen anything from the Bucks bench that makes me confident for their chances in the playoffs. However, the Bucks have looked much improved after their All-Star break, with impressive wins over the Timberwolves and 76ers. I think more things are going to start falling into place with this team now that the roster has gotten adjusted to new head coach Doc Rivers, but is it enough to bring them a title, or even a finals appearance? That remains to be seen, however they slide into the number 5 slot because I know this core can win championships. It's just a matter of players performing at their peak in May, which is still an unknown at this point in time. At number 4 I have the Minnesota Timberwolves. At the beginning of the season, I was a non-believer of this Timberwolves core. Last season scared me off completely, as their entire team just fell off both on and off the court. But after watching this team for over 50 games, I'm happy to report that I was completely wrong about this team, and that they've completely exceeded mine and I'm sure everyone's expectations. The highlight of this team is defense, as they allow the least amount of points and field goals made per game and it's because of the efforts of perimeter defenders Anthony Edwards and Jaden McDaniels, and, more prominently, the efforts of Rudy Gobert, who has all but locked up the Defensive Player of the Year award with 25 games left in the season. We all know this team can lock up defensively when it comes down to it, but my main concern with this team is their inconsistency on the offensive side of the ball. We know how dynamic of scores Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns are, as either have the potential to go off for 40 on any given night. But after that, the Timberwolves struggle to find consistent production on that side of the ball. And because of it, the Timberwolves have accumulated some bad losses against teams like the Spurs and the Hornets, with that Charlotte loss coming when Cat had 70 points. But unlike teams like the Bucks and Knicks, where there are certain factors that can and will improve before playoff time, this is likely the final version of the Timberwolves that we're going to see. And to me, that's perfectly fine. Because while the offense is a little concerning, I know the defense is going to show up on a nightly basis no matter who they play. Let's take their game against the Clippers just two weeks ago for example, as those two teams could realistically play each other in the playoffs. In that game, James Harden shot 5 for 13, Paul George shot 5 for 16, and Russell Westbrook shot 3 for 11, and the Timberwolves won by 21 points. While I don't think they're going to be able to completely shut down a team with so many dynamic scores in a playoff scenario, I at least know that they can limit them. And it was just last year in the first round where Jokic and the Nuggets said that the Timberwolves were their hardest series. And from that point on, Minnesota has only gotten better. With all of that under consideration, the Timberwolves secure the fourth spot for me because they at least have a second round floor and a championship ceiling. And no matter who they face, I know they're going to put up a good fight, even if they ultimately lose. Speaking of the Clippers, I put LA's forgotten team at number 3, and here's why. The Clippers have this guy named Kawhi Leonard, and when he's in the playoffs, he goes from a top 10 player in the league to a top 3 player in the league. And when you surround him with a secondary star in Paul George, a playmaker who can create their own shot in James Harden, a sixth man that can provide when Kawhi's on the bench in Russell Westbrook, and a supporting cast that ranks second in the league in three-point percentage, it would take very special circumstances to take him down. And when compared to the rest of the West, no team has a combination of offense and defense the Clippers have. This should be the year the Clippers finally get over the hump and make the NBA Finals. So why do I have them at three? Well, two reasons mainly. First and foremost, the Clippers are a cursed franchise that has never found success in the 54 years the team has been in the NBA. I've seen it when I was a kid for the Lob City Clippers, when everything seemed to be going right and then an injury or some of the worst choke jobs in NBA history took them down. And I've seen it in college as well, when the Clippers blew a 3-1 lead in the bubble or when Kawhi tore his ACL right after it was clear the Clippers were a tier above every other team in the West. Like how I somewhat trust history telling me the Thunder won't win a title this season because their team is so young, I have to at least consider the Clippers playoff history when doing these rankings. And I don't think there's any worse combination to have than taking one of the worst playoff performers in the league in James Harden and putting him on the Clippers. And that's where my second point comes in. James Harden has shown us time in and time out, as recently as last season, that he just isn't built for May. 
and all the signs keep telling me to put this team lower, but then they come out and they dominate the Celtics in Boston, and I'm back in. I just don't know how to gauge this team, and I don't know how they're going to perform in the playoffs. But I'm going to keep them at number 3, because overall, the Clippers might have the best roster in the league, and I can't count out Kawhi in the playoffs after what I've seen the past 10 years. And now we're down to the final two, and while I went back and forth between who deserved the top spot, I ultimately went with Denver over Boston. Here's why I think Boston deserves to be just a little more respected this season than last. The Celtics currently have a 46-12 record, the best in the league by over 5 games. The Celtics have a 24-11 record against teams above 500, the best in the NBA. The Celtics have a 122.2 offensive rating and a 111.6 defensive rating, the first and third best in the league respectively. The Celtics have undoubtedly the best starting lineup in the league with a great mixture of scoring, defense, and shooting. And the Celtics have playoff experience with Tatum, Brown, Holiday, White, and Horford, and a starting center built to thrive in the playoffs in Porzingis. But what makes me hesitant to put Boston at the top spot, despite having the best team in the league, is their past playoff woes. Yes, their playoff experience is extensive, but the Celtics have only made one finals in the Tatum and Brown era, and in that run, they got past the Chris Middleton less Bucks in seven, and were a Jimmy Butler three away from losing once again in the Eastern Conference Finals. I've seen time and time again where the Celtics looked to have the better team and ultimately fell short. But I will admit, this team is much better than all previous Celtics teams, and it seems like Boston has gone all in for this season. Luckily for them, if there were any year to go all in, this was certainly the year, where the teams up top in the West are young and inexperienced, and the teams up top in the East have gone through changes in their coaching staff and their roster. Everything feels in place for the Celtics to make the NBA Finals, and if I were a betting man, I would pick the Celtics to win the East. But there's one team that I believe would beat them in a series, and that's the Denver Nuggets, who claim the top spot on this list. There's nothing I've seen this season from the Nuggets that's made me concerned for their repeat aspirations. And as they say, to be the man, you gotta beat the man. And in a seven game series, with the roster that sits around Jokic, I don't think there's any team at this moment that can beat the Nuggets. There's certainly still some depth concerns after the loss of Jeff Green and Bruce Brown from last season's title run, but I honestly think Christian Brown and Peyton Watson have filled their roles serviceably. What I think will be a crucial aspect of the Nuggets' potential playoff run is home court advantage. In the playoffs last season, the Nuggets went 10-1 at home and 6-3 and on the road. And if a team like the Timberwolves finish with the first seed and the Nuggets face off against them in the conference finals, it would be a tough series for Denver, especially considering three of the four wins in their series against Minnesota last season were by single digits. But other than that, from a roster perspective, they may not be the most talented on paper, but they have the same core that wiped through the playoffs last season, and they have the best player on the planet. And at this moment in time, I think this is Denver's title to lose. But what do you think? Comment below your pick to win the NBA title this season, and remember to leave a like and subscribe for more NBA videos just like this one. I'm Julian with Talkback Sports, and I'll see you next time.